Good morning, LCR. We're so glad that you're able to join us for worship this morning. The band is back together. We have everybody here, and we're in the church to offer praise to God. So we're glad you're able to join us this morning, whether it's in Huntington Beach or somewhere else, and we hope that you'll join your heart to ours as we offer God praise and thanksgiving for everything God has done in our lives. Welcome to worship. Good morning, church. Glad to be back with you. You are my everything and I 
lightning rolls of thunder. Let us pray. God, when the heavens are opened, we see the Lamb seated on the throne like one who was slain. And seeing that vision of you in your glory, victorious over death, sin, the devil, the world, everything, we direct our worship to you and our praise. We stand in awe of you, and yet we see your way, which is a way of gentleness and healing and wholeness. And so, God, we offer you our worship, and we direct our hearts now to your word, that we can hear from you, be addressed by you, and be shaped according to this wonderful vision, the vision of your glory. Bless us now as we hear your word in your name. Amen. The lesson from today comes from Isaiah chapter 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary 
and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here ends the lesson. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for today comes from Mark chapter 1. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or, pos or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here ends the gospel. You may be seated. Well, a reminder that we're getting close to the beginning of Lent, which means Ash Wednesday is nearby, a week from this Wednesday. And we'll have two services. Both of them will be outside in the courtyard, one at 12.30 at lunch, and then one at 7. And the 7 is the only one that we'll put on Zoom. So 12.30 will be in person, no Zoom. 7 o'clock will be in the courtyard, Zoom, and we will do imposition of ashes for Ash Wednesday in a little bit. A reminder that once Lent comes, you'll be able to get, we'll have our app available that we'll um, give you information on, and we'll have in there the daily meditations for our parish-wide small catechism. So if you want to spend literally just a minute or two every day with Martin Luther, we're going to be reading through the small catechism and just reviewing that. So it's not going to be heavy lifting, it's not going to be an in-depth teaching, it's just going to be a simple reminder of the baseline of faith, which includes the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Apostles' Creed, baptism and communion, and the like. So kind of just a baseline. That's the baseline understanding of our faith. So in many ways, Lutherans are kind of theological minimalists. I mean, you can adorn it with this or that, but we have this baseline that we want everyone to be conversant at. Well, if you listen closely to what Jamie just read, especially from the prophet Isaiah, we had this extraordinary vision of God looking down onto the passability of the earth. You know, like if you see a picture of earth from outer space, you can't tell that there are people running around, you don't see people in cars, you don't see armies and illnesses and successes, you just see the big blue ball. And the prophet's looking down from God's perspective on earth, and all of us look like bugs, grasshoppers. Everything starts to get going, and then everything quickly passes away. The generations come and go. And we have this vision of God in charge calling out every star by name. And we know there are a lot of stars and galaxies, and so God would appear to be quite busy with all of that. But the same God who is intentionally calling out each star by name and probably each galaxy and supernova and every other part of the universe is also intimately connected to the people Israel, the people of the Bible, the people of promise. And so the people of promise go, well, God doesn't care about us and God's not paying attention to us. And God goes, don't you know anything? Haven't you heard anything that we've said this whole time? The same God that calls the stars by name is the same God who's looking down at you and knows you, grasshopper that you are, grass that you are. And so for anyone out there who needs to hear this, even if you don't hear anything else in the sermon, the God who calls the stars by name knows your name too and is interested in what's happening to you right now and is interested in you being connected to the same intentional life that has arranged the entire universe. And so that's where we get kind of a, a crazy 
scaling up where we go, well, if God cares about the universe, God can care about us and our individuality. And that's actually not the case at all. God is very interested in what happens to us. And what we saw last week was that Jesus takes this same creative power and applied it to that person in the synagogue who was corrupted by an unclean spirit or a demon. We talked about the demons of Beverly Hills in the basement and all of that, Edward Doheny last week. And then Jesus takes that same power after church and brings it home with Simon and Andrew. This is an important detail that after church last week, Jesus and the disciples did not go out to brunch. Now, maybe Capernaum doesn't have a great brunch scene. Who knows why they didn't? And two, you know, they, they do the Sabbath differently than we do church. Uh, but nonetheless, they go straight from church to the house where Simon and Andrew lives, and it's a reminder that these disciples actually had lives. They were married. Peter had a wife. Peter has a mother-in-law. And so sometimes we think of the early followers of Jesus as these kind of two-dimensional characters that we see in paintings, and that it was easy for them to follow. Well, it must have been easy. They didn't have anything else going on. And we forget that someone like Peter has a wife who's probably saying, you're going to do what? You're following who? She goes, you haven't finished painting the bathroom, and you're going to go follow someone around and you know, walk around Galilee and heal people? Now, she could have been supportive. Maybe she was very supportive. But it's a reminder that the call that Jesus had for the disciples interrupted their lives down to the deepest part of their families, and Peter's mother-in-law is living with him at home. And Jesus brings that same creative power, the power that says, have you not known? Have you not heard? I call the stars by name. Oh, and I know Peter's mother-in-law the same power that came to the synagogue last week, now comes into a house. And that's really what I want to challenge you with or encourage you with. What does it look like when Jesus brings the gift of the good news home? What does it look like when Jesus brings the gift of the good news to your home? And so now we're not talking about demon possession. We're not talking about sort of a very public event. We're talking about the gospel taking root in a home and bringing more wholeness, more healing, more forgiveness than there was before. Now we know Jesus healing Simon's mother-in-law. We don't know if she had the flu or we don't know if she had a chronic illness. We don't know what was going on with her. So we don't know what this healing meant for her. And I don't know, you know, sometimes you're sick for a moment. Sometimes you're living with a chronic illness And the idea is Jesus being present in our homes just helps us move along to a place of healing and wholeness. And maybe something dramatic like the story, but it may be the long struggle of watching the good news emerge very quietly in our family relationships. So as soon as Jesus gets to the house, they say, hey, come talk to the mother-in-law. He goes and grabs her by the hand. He lifts her up. And that image of lifting up is a key image in all the Gospels for resurrection. In the same way Jesus lifts her up from her sickness, eventually Jesus will lift her out of her death. You know, all of these healings are pointing toward that moment where God promises, not only will I call the stars by their names, I will call you out of the grave individually, lifting you up by the hand. And it says the fever left her. That sense of the fever leaving Simon's mother-in-law is the same word that gets used for forgiveness. And there's an interesting connectivity between healing and forgiveness that happens in the New Testament. We see it in the book of James. We see it in the story this morning from the gospel. This idea that part of God's peace, God's shalom, God's making life whole and verdant and fruitful in every dimension includes a healing that is simultaneously a forgiving. Now, it may be that in your home you don't have any sick people, not like Peter's mother-in-law, but it may mean that in your home there are things that need that same power of forgiveness and wholeness making, because home's usually the place where we have the most pent-up anger and brokenness and resentment, and you know, we live with those people all the time. During the pandemic, some people have said, oh my gosh, I can't live with these people another hour, you know, because being home hasn't been good for them. And so this idea that Jesus comes home into the midst of families that have been interrupted by his call, but gives them a gift of healing 
forgiveness, wholeness making, is something that is my prayer for us and for you, that God might do the same, that that same power that calls the stars might also come and bring a little healing at home in your families, especially if your mother-in-law is sick or doesn't like you or whatever, or if you don't like your mother-in-law, the same, you need the same kind of healing. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens um, after she's healed. She gets up and she serves them. Now, you could see this as kind of a sad obligation where she's like, oh, great, you know, I've been in bed five years and now first thing I have to do is get up and make Jesus lunch. Um, But I don't think that's what happens. I think when Jesus heals her, she's not obligated to do anything. Now she's whole. Part of being healed and being made whole and being forgiven means you now have a choice of what to do after you've received this gift. And so she doesn't just serve them, like she says, well, and then she went out and washed Jesus' car. She ministers. It's the same word we use for ministering. She takes on this ministry out of her own experience of God being good to her, and she shares that with someone else. She gives some of it back to God, which is Jesus. She gives some of it to her son-in-law, Simon, and his brother, Andrew. And there's a powerful connection between an encounter with God and then finding some way to be a minister, being a servant. This is very key, and this was very key for the Reformation, this idea that once you've heard the gospel, you're free. You're literally free. There's nothing you have to do. God's done for you what you could not do for yourself. You can't give God anything for the way God's loved you. It's not a transaction. It was a gift. And so if you want to give God something, well, love somebody, serve somebody, do it for their sake, out of gratitude for what God has done for you. This is something that Paul tells the Corinthians. He's kind, of, he's kind of ramping up still. We've had several weeks with Paul and the Corinthians. He's ramping up to his famous chapter on love and before that spiritual gifts. But he tells the Corinthians, he goes, I know that I'm free. I'm servant to nobody. I can do whatever I want. But, he goes, I will make myself slave to all if it means that someone else experiences the goodness from God that I experienced. So Paul says, look, if I'm with Jews, I'll talk to them like I'm a Jew. If I'm with Romans, I'll talk to them like I'm a Roman. If I'm with Buccaneers fans, I'll pretend that I like Tom Brady. If I'm with, uh, you know, whoever Kansas City fans will say, isn't Patrick Mahomes the greatest quarterback ever and he's so young and whatever. Paul is willing to become a different person no matter where he goes if it means that someone else might experience the gift of healing that he got from Christ. That encounter is so fundamental to who Paul is that he wants to make sure that others experience what it's like to be loved by someone who's free. I mean, think of this sense of obligation. Obligation is something that happens when we go to places that do not love us, the post office, the DMV, places we have to go, but they don't care one way or the other about who you are, just by the nature of what they are. But when someone says, you know what, I have a... I, I have other things to do, but I want to sit and talk to you. I want to listen to you. They make a choice for us. When someone makes a choice to make space for us, that has a very different effect because then we feel the experience of love. And so this is what Paul says, I want to make space for others. This is what Peter's mother-in-law does. I want to make space so that others can experience what I've experienced, the healing of that, and I freely choose to do it. This becomes the key to the gospel. God has done great things for you. There's nothing you can do to give God back. So rather, everything you give to others is also a gift. That's why Paul says in Corinthians, he says, look, I could charge people for this. I could put together a series of lectures and say, for only three payments of ninety-nine, ninety-five, you too can have the wisdom of St. Paul. He goes, I don't charge anyone anything because I want everyone to have an accessibility to the freedom and the free gift that I got from Jesus. So if you want to think kind of in summary of what we've talked about, in the same way that Jesus encountered the person with the spirit in the synagogue, the unclean spirit, in the same way Jesus encountered the mother-in-law, Jesus encounters you. The same God that knows the names of the stars knows your name. The same God that orders the universe wants you to be part of this wonderful order of what God has created, and it is an immense and diverse and wonderful place, and you have a place there. And 
God doesn't just want your encounter with Christ to be something that happens outside your house, at church, in Bible study, by yourself. God wants this power to visit the intimate places of your life where oftentimes we may feel constrained or we may have a lot that needs to be made whole and healed. And so in the same way, God brought that power to Peter's house, so he brings it to yours and see what happens when he comes and when he shows up. And then finally, once we've experienced that gift or once we're on the way, because sometimes, sometimes the healing that God brings into your life is very slow. Sometimes it's an instant like this, but sometimes it's a very slow awakening and wholeness making. And sometimes your body doesn't get well even as your spirit does. So that's another kind of healing that happens. And we've experienced that in the church. But however it is that God chooses to preach the good news to you, however God chooses to do that, in your freedom, you now have a choice. In your freedom, you have a choice of where you direct your liberty for the sake of your neighbor. I mean, think about it. That's something so fundamental to Christianity. It's something so fundamental to American democracy. You are free, and how now will you use your freedom? And especially for your faith, how will you use your freedom so others might know the gift that God has brought into the world? It is a gift of healing. It is a gift of freedom. Amen. Well, now we want to confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers today, we want to remember the family of Gordon Rosen. Gordon passed away, and so we want to remember April and Brian, his children, also his family and friends and those who love him. His service will be in a couple of weeks, and you'll hear more information about that once the details have been firmed up, and we'll be sharing those as they come, but you'll be hearing more about that. There will be a portion that will be live, but there will also be a Zoom for many of us to access online. We want to pray then for all of those who have experienced loss. We want to pray for families in our parish who have loved ones with coronavirus who are struggling. We've had several people who have not um, kind of recovered their health since that experience, and we want to pray for them as well. So let us join our hearts in prayer, trusting that God loves us and loves to hear us. God, we thank you that you are the one who looks down upon our fragile earth for lives that rise and fall so quickly like grasshoppers or like grass, and that as you arrange the universe or all of the cosmos or whatever it is that you've made, that in the naming of all the stars and planets and galaxies and nebula and everything else, you look upon us and know us and love us, surprised that we would even think that you didn't. It's a temptation we have, God, to feel somehow disconnected, to feel unknown, to feel unloved, to feel that we have to carry our brokenness by ourselves. Lord Jesus, bring your healing, bring your gospel into our homes. You know the places that we need wholeness. You know the people who need their hands grabbed and lifted up. Bring your healing to those who are suffering. Let them taste your forgiveness and your grace and know that you are good. And God, surprise us with the fruit that you grow in our homes. For every time that we've been met by you, for every time that you have encountered us, for every time that you have said the good news to us again, remind us of the freedom that we find ourselves with. And may we again and again choose to love, and may we again and again choose to care for those who need it most. May others know your goodness and your healing through our hands. We pray for those who have passed away, our brother Gordon, for those who grieve him, especially April and Brian and their families. 
for those who will gather to remember all of your promises. God, to all of your beloved dead, may you sing over them and may their memory be eternal in your presence. We pray for all of those in our congregation still affected by COVID-19 and for those who have not experienced a return to wholeness, for those who still have breathing problems and other issues related to COVID, we pray. For those who are suffering silently or struggling, for those who are lonely, for those who are dealing with mental anguish and mental illness, may you bless them during this time. We commend ourselves to you, God, knowing that you are good and knowing that we can entrust ourselves to you, our living, our dying, our sickness, our health, our sadness, our joy, our brokenness, we give it all to you, knowing that you will take it and bring it to your feast of joy, which we now prepare to share. In your name, amen.
What a wonderful prayer. Healing is in your hands. We actually had in the chat two more names that we want to pray for, both for healing. One's for Mackenzie, who's going to have knee surgery tomorrow, and I think many of you know Mackenzie. Also for the Charlton's daughter, Nicole, who's having back surgery. So let's say a prayer for both Mackenzie and Nicole and all those having medical procedures this week. God, healing is in your hands. And so we pray that those healing hands surround Mackenzie tomorrow as she prepares for knee surgery and on Tuesday for Nicole. May your Holy Spirit bless them both with wholeness to protect them from danger. And may they experience um, a return to health after this time of uh, adjustment. So we ask for your blessing upon them and all those who will be undergoing difficult things this week. And we ask this in your name. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, take this cup, all of you, and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to his supper. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now let us pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are present to us here in this bread and wine, your body and blood. Take us by the hand and raise us up. Raise us up to a place of life and wholeness and health. Let forgiveness be the currency along the way. And once we've tasted that freedom, may we find ways to offer it to others as a sign of what you have done the calling out of the stars, the calling out of a new day, the day of resurrection. Bless us with this grace, and we ask this in your name. Amen. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong. Yes. 
song to end our worship on, this idea that God, the everlasting God, uh, will lift us up on the wings of eagles, especially for any of you that are feeling weary and feeling tired, especially after all the pandemic stuff, just know that God is not tired. Even if your own strength fails, even if you're young and your strength fails, we hear in the Bible that God's strength never fails and that God will lift you up and God will lift you to the heights. And so I hope that this week you experience God's strength, even if you're in a time of tiredness. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.